to take a moment to welcome everyone. We have over 50 countries represented for this webinar and uh, over 300 registrants. So we're very happy to have that uh, uh, amount of engagement. Uh, Jack Farr, Andreas Komal, and I are going to present three cases, as you see here. This is part of a webinar series that has been assembled uh, in 2021. And um, while I know much of our educational initiatives have been in response to the pandemic, I think these are some things that make it very efficient and easy for all of us uh, to teach one another and to continue to uh, interact. But obviously, it'll never replace uh, all the benefits of a face-to-face -face meeting. What we will do uh, is allow, assuming time permits and the flow goes well, what we'll do is, uh, these are just three 20 minute cases. We will allow question and answer through the question and answer chat box that you see on the bottom right. So we're going to uh, re review three cases in sort of uh, ascending level of difficulty and thought processes. The first case will be a, a focal cartilage defect in the medial from a condyle and an athlete. The second one will be a bipolar lesion of the patella from a joint in an individual with patella instability. And the third case will be a chondral defect uh, in someone who has meniscal deficiency, issues with the ACL, and also malalignment. So I'll start with mine, and uh, I'm just going to disconnect my audio so you can hear the uh, sound bite that for this particular case. Or uh, currently a 20 year old college student at a division one school and you played point guard. And two years ago, you had a left knee debridement for a, a patella cartilage defect and you were able to get back to play pretty well. Oh, sorry guys. Or uh, currently a 20 year old college student at a division one school and you played point guard. And two years ago, you had a left knee debridement for a, a patella cartilage defect and you were able to get back to play pretty reliably and had no problems. Right. However, over the last three weeks, no injury you can cite. You've had right knee pain mm -hmm. that's really inhibited your ability to play for more than two to three minutes before you get pain and swelling. Correct. You do not recall an injury? No. Where's the pain located? On the right side of my knee and then kind of over here on the patella and then some and the back. Okay. Since this started, have you limited your play or are you just trying to push through it? Just trying to push through it. And have you been suffering for that in terms of discomfort? Yes. And has your performance been compromised? Yes. Okay. Um, your goal is to play how many more years? Two more years. Have you ever redshirted or taken a medical redshirt? No. You have a redshirt remaining now, is that correct? Correct. How many more games could you play before that would be compromised? Um, six more games. So if you played six more games, you would no longer have the option to take the medical redshirt. Correct. And then you might miss a year of school if you of play, unless you got a medical redshirt, right. which is another way to get around it. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Your desire is to play, is that correct? Correct. All right. As you currently stand, do you believe your knee would allow you to play at any reasonable level? Uh, no. The more I play, the more it hurts. Okay. And the more it falls up. Okay. So I recognize there are some uh, attributes of this case that are sort of United States dependent. Um, there's some attributes of this case simply because, you know, this is a college student who has a scholarship in the United States. We have the opportunity for, uh, say, a four-year school to extend it to a five-year because they can get a medical red shirt uh, as they recover from an injury. So they can actually go to college for five years to accumulate their four years of sport. And there's some nuances of it, but that's why we spend some of the time discussing that. So, uh, Jack, you know, with this particular uh, instance, uh, you've got someone who's got a little bit of time on his side. He has ability to, he wants to play, but he says he cannot play. I'm curious if there's any other attributes of the history that would be important for you to make a decision um, with respect to the treatment. Uh, not really, other than I want to know about mechanical symptoms, and recurrent effusions. Okay, so he doesn't uh, complain. He, he complains of a little bit of clicking, but it's not always painful. And his biggest complaint is weight-bearing pain and effusions. Andreas, is there any other features of the history that you might find uh, uh, helpful? Um, did you talk about alignment Have, and whether he tried to brace on loader? So he, he is neutrally aligned and he has not tried to brace. But, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I would say, would you feel optimistic? And, and we, you know what, we didn't discuss the lesion probably should do that. And that's okay. It's not related to brace or no brace, but why don't you just tell me about the features of this that you see and would your decision-making differ? Would you, would you care about this? For example, if he had no symptoms and this was picked up on a pre 
preseason physical because everyone gets an MRI in a preseason physical, for example, would this bother you? Or uh, if he had no symptoms, would you counsel him in any way? Or, uh, and is there any features about this that pushes you to be a little more aggressive surgically? Um, I'm, I'm using that as a segue from your brace concept of maybe trying something else in addition to, this, to injections. And I think overall, the most concerning thing about this is just how extensive his bone marrow edema is, um, which tells me that this is not just a lesion. And we pick up lesions all the time, but that this is an active lesion and, and likely his pain is coming from that. So yeah. hence the unloading. If, there's, if we can somehow calm down his edema, he might be okay playing with the lesion. So, so are you, okay, so you think a brace might do that or you think just shutting him down for a bit? I think shutting him down a little bit, using a brace, using intraticular injections, and then I don't want to go too far ahead, but I, I have some thoughts of what I would do arthroscopically. But Okay. All right. So then I'm going to give you a little more uh, of, of an interview with him, just some other thoughts I had when I was meeting with him just to help make a decision. So let me um, get the audio going on that. If you went for surgical treatment, what would be your primary goal? What would be a meaningful outcome to you? Uh, being able to play with at least a lot of pain. Okay. And if it meant a shorter procedure, meaning a, a quicker return to play with the risk of symptoms coming back or incompletely being resolved versus a little longer recovery by maybe eight weeks to 12 weeks with a more reliable reduction in pain, just being one surgery, what would you pick? Uh, the longer recovery time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So Andreas, um, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but I was just trying to get at, you know, there are some situations where a simple debridement or other might be warranted, but we know that it may not be as long lasting, may not be as definitive. It may not, it may be inconsistent with the, the athlete's timeline in terms of duration and so forth. Does, uh, does the additional information help you? And if not, just you know, where are you at mentally with him? We're going to operate on him. So um, right. tell me what you, where you are as far as thought processes and what you might explain to him as far as options. So, you know, that was very helpful actually, because you could either say, Hey, let's try the minimal thing. Um, that might make you better. In, for me, I think that's more helpful in people who still play, but who are just looking for marginal improvement. If somebody can't play right now, the last thing you want to do is just do some sort of small operation and then they still can't play and you've lost time. So initially I was thinking maybe more a chondroplasty um, to see if he has any loose flaps and then maybe doing a bone marrow injection into the bone to see if we can calm down that inflammation. I've had some success with that. But for him, you think that's inflammation going, or would you, are you comfortable calling that inflammation? Are you comfortable calling it a lesion or are you comfortable, comfortable just calling it a stress reaction? It, it's a stress reaction. So it's a bone marrow lesion. Um, yeah. Inflammation is the bone is irritated. That that's what hurts. Um, I think for him, I, I still don't have a good concept of how large that cartridge defect actually is. Okay. Well, why don't we go to that? Okay. Yeah. So, um, if you saw this lesion, is this one that you would say, let's just say timeline was not emphasized during the discussion. And if you saw this, is this one that you would say, yeah, that's likely given his symptoms of weight bearing pain, he complains of clicking, but that's not painful. And he has effusions. <clears throat> Do you feel that if everything was available to you, that a debridement would be enough for him or not? I don't think so. No, okay. given the extensive. Uh, what would you have to see in the lesion to say otherwise, Andreas? In other words, what would you, what would make you feel better about? Hey, you might respond to debridement. If, if mechanical symptoms are the mainstay, if he says, "Look, there's some catching in there, and that catching hurts," then I'd feel pretty good about a debridement alone. Okay, uh, Jack. Any comments about uh, deletion configuration, response to debridement, or other? Yeah, I would like to focus on the subchondral stress fracture reaction because. That is so much larger than I would expect for a lesion this size. Uh, we all see these patients that have early delamination disease, and I would be I would be very cautious with him in counseling because I think that lesion, I think there the disease process is greater than the area that you see arthroscopically. But yeah, the, I would agree. Initial treatment, I would agree with Andreas. Okay, so then let's let's <clears throat> move forward. So. Um, what would your treatment be for that lesion, Jack? I would just simple debridement. I would, 
I would do is Andreas, I'd do bone marrow aspirate concentrate combined with the suspension of demineralized bone matrix and inject that into the area of the stress response. And Andreas, anything different on you? I might consider actually doing an oats plug for him, just a small oats plug, maybe do um, something anterior and posterior to that because there's an oblong lesion. I think that- I thing's about 28 long and yeah. um, about eight wide, eight or 10 wide on the lateral from Wakanda. That's, How would you yeah. do it, oats? What would you do? Would you do two plugs or just one in the middle or what would your preference be? I might do two eight millimeter plugs and I've started to okay. backfill yeah. them more. I mean, he's a basketball player, he said. So the, the only thing I worry about in oats is for, for plyometric, for jumping sports, taking it from, from the trochlea might be an issue. So I backfill yeah, them now with an L, small plug. Uh, yeah, I do. I do worry about that as well, but I think it's an option. But what we did is we BMAC'd behind and we um, we microfractured him. And I, my decision to microfracture was hoping that we could shield his bone um, with uh, marrow stimulation and fibrocartilage development because I think his bone, as you pointed out, Jack, is obviously more reactive. We see this a lot. I think that what's what's present intraarticularly isn't necessarily represented. Um, by the MRI. And, uh, you know, we don't always know what to do with it because we see asymptomatic marrow edema as well. But um, nonetheless, <clears throat> this is what I chose to do. And um, just any quick comments about the technique? Uh, well, it may be, I, I would like to say yeah. that you used the term, so I treated it with microfracture and we know- Yeah, I call it drilling, we'll call it micro drilling. Right, and I think, I think there's nuances on how you approach marrow stimulation. And I think these are in evolution. I, I personally like micro drilling deeper than the old microfracture and you're showing that now. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you what we showed is that drilling versus fracture. We looked at a series of patients uh, who were matched and 34 had an all and 34 had drilled. And we looked at our revision rates and this is what often happens after an all you see a big fracture response. And that's why I think load protection and post-op is so important because you're really creating a fracture environment in this situation where you're using an all. When we drill them, the bone is quieter. These are not the same patient. These are different patients. And we saw for our revision rates for all versus drilling. You can see here for all was about 40% failure uh, required revision versus 17%. It's not a perfect study, mind you, but I do believe intuitively anyway, the drilling is the right way to go. And, yeah. you know, there is some data for this that supports it um, in, in athletes. And I think the big issue is do it correctly. I, I think drilling is the right way to, to think about it. Um, there, you know, you will find literature to support marrow stimulation. My, the key reason I didn't do oats, which I would have loved to have done is just because of what Andreas pointed out. I just worry about, about, you know, the concept of robbing Peter to pay Paul here in terms of taking from another donor site. And, um, I, I felt like it was his first line treatment and I knew if it failed, I'd be going to, you know, an allograft, but you know, so obviously I'm worried. And I think this is one, I think Andreas implied, you got to hang or Jack, you got to hang a lot of crepe for a case like this because the bone is pretty excited and the bone is probably excited largely because the, the joint is incompetent at that level. There's, there's some, I mean, the data is actually fairly reinforcing for marrow stimulation in, in, in all sports. I don't do a ton of marrow stimulation anymore, but I felt like given the configuration of this lesion and the timing, everything it was the right thing to do. But unfortunately he didn't get better. And uh, at six, he never got any response to, towards improvement. In other words, I, I, we went six months, he said he still had load pain. There was never a trajectory towards improvement. And here's his, um, his MRI, which, you know, pretty, I looks thought good. obviously looked pretty good, but you know, he still doesn't feel good. And, yeah. um, uh, so we tried PRP. I tried high molecular weight HA and, and, a, and, uh, looks like poor PRP and he just didn't feel better. So it was uh, very frustrating that he had gone six months, no relief. I mean, we certainly counseled him. He's a guard. He's a, you know, sort of a, 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 a high energy athletic player, maybe a different position could be do differently, but he, he was better for ADLs, but still could not play. So this is what I went back and this is what he had. And I think we achieved our goal, right? Of getting fiber cartilage fill, but we did not achieve our goal. We won how it looks to the naked eye, but we failed um, in terms of um, our ability to give him pain relief. So, uh, so Andreas, uh, I, obviously what we see and how people feel can be very different things. And um, your thoughts here, first of all, would you have operated on him again? I didn't get go there, but you know, his x-rays were the same. His MRI was more quiet. His bone marrow was better, um, you know, but he's still hurt. So what are your thoughts on revision treatment if you even would offer revision treatment? So I think that that is a little bit more difficult decision because you, I think you said for ADLs, he was doing fine. It was really just for sports, but that yes. just happens to be his thing. So 
it, as long as he understands that um, return to sports, even with revision surgery, is not a given. Um, I, I mean, I would offer him another operation because that's important to him. Is his meniscus okay? Yeah, his meniscus is okay. Yeah, I didn't give so, a good shot of it, but it was okay. Yeah. So in terms of options, I mean, there aren't all that many. As long as his alignment is fine, obviously osteotomy, which would be great otherwise, is not an option. So I think that would be a revision with an allograft for me. It's just tricky because it's a long lesion. Um, yeah. So whether you use two smaller plugs overlapping rather than one big one. And, uh, so, Jack, so on this, uh, if you'll run that video again, I, I agree that you know you have fibrocartilage filled, but over to the right, you've got one little small divot, and then I can see some exposed bone coming into view. So Jack? this lesion no, is much blood. larger, I think, hang than on, on. you know what this, we originally yeah, saw. Yeah, this is blood, I think. Uh, you saw something red over here. Yeah, that was blood, I think. Okay, well, I, but I he see does a have defect. a little. There's a little there's fissure a, here. Yeah, that's a fissure. This is blood. So, but what you're saying is that the lesion, the, the compromised cartilage, may be bigger than what we're seeing in the, with the micro with the with the yes. micro drilling fill. Okay, okay. So, uh, what we did is a uh, in this case we did a snowman graft, yeah. and we did two fifteens, and we were able to get it all out of there. And maybe the thing was twenty eight, as I mentioned, and obviously had to take a little bit more uh, normal cartilage. Um, and I guess the question I have um, as we as we round this out. Um, do you guys have any strong concerns? And this is some stuff that we've looked at it. I'm sure you guys have as, as well as, you know, we do struggle with, um, there's a so-called bio uni, which is really meant for the medial side in terms of an instrumentation to create one oblique plug uh, or a graft uh, versus using this sort of credit card phenomenon. We used to call it the MasterCard or a snowman overlapping graphs. Um, I can tell you what we showed in our group uh, with overlapping grafts versus multifocal lesions. In other words, we compared a single lesion tree with overlapping graft versus patients who had multifocal lesions where tree was just singular plugs, and we looked at how they did. And I'll share with you what we found, but I'd want to ask you all what you think about the concept of overlapping grafts, and are there any uh, pit particular pitfalls? Um, and from an outcomes point of view, do we have any additional concerns because we had to use two plugs? Uh, Andreas, why don't you start? I think the bio-uni is, is an interesting concept because with overlapping grafts, you just have, you have a lot of interfaces. You have allograft against allograft. So I think as a concept, the bio-uni is nice. I, I was always concerned that the thinner is pretty thick and you end up transplanting a lot of bone, which generally we're trying to, um, to avoid. So I've gone away and I've actually gone back to overlapping plugs. And then um, number two, you had just quickly briefly mentioned the instrumentation is designed for the medial side, and I think it fits better medially. Laterally, it's tricky. You have to be really careful because it's a long plug. And if the radius of curvature is not exactly right between your, your donor and your recipient, you can get a decent amount of overhang um, or proudness anteriorly and posteriorly. So technically, it's more challenging laterally than medially. And one of our questions was about intraarticular injections. Um, I will tell you that the injection that this person had was high molecular weight, hyaluronic acid times three at the same time a leukocyte poor PRP was given at the same time and spread out by seven to 10 days, but he had no benefit. I use that a lot for osteoarthritis. Unfortunately, it looks like there's another question in Arabic and I wish I read Arabic, so I apologize. I don't. Uh, but if you want to translate that to English, we can take a question. Um, so, uh, we showed actually that the snowman didn't do as well as we, our patients who had multifocal defects did uh, better, the treated with single plugs did better than snowman. But the reality is I think a snowman person is a different, gra is a different problem. I think these long oblique lesions, not like in this age group, but the long obliques are typically um, uh, more arthritic in nature, if you will. And I think they just come in a different patient group physiologically. Um, the other question that often comes up is, should we be concerned about doing an OA graft or an ACI after marrow stimulation? And we talk about this an awful lot. And Andreas, I'll just ask you to comment because I know you were uh, one of the, uh, the, the primary authors on this series with uh, Tom Minus when you were at, uh, in, in, the, in uh, at Mass General. Right. Um, so tell me, um, do you have any concerns now? What is your sort of flavor of the day if you're going to revise marrow stimulation? I mean, overall, it Generally, I've used more OCA grafts recently anyways than ACI, but it, I do use ACI and you're just going to weigh the, the benefits and downsides. So if I have a failed microfracture in the patellofemoral joint, I would probably still favor ACI, but 
I think not all microfractures are done equally. And if I see someone who has a lot of subchondral edema and lots of cysts and, and a thickened um, subchondral plate, I, I would stay away from another surface treatment like Macy. While if it's quiet, like your post-op MRI scan look great. I wouldn't worry about doing a Macy on top of that, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, that's a, I, I, and, uh, Jack, any further comments on that as far as- Yeah, I think it, you know, it what, depends what on the health of the bone. Yeah. So I think this study, what we looked at it and we showed there were no differences. In other words, if you look at the graph on the right, we had ACI status post marrow stimulation and compared to primary ACI, we also had OA graft after marrow stimulation compared to primary OA graft and they looked very similar. And then we compared the two, they actually looked very similar. So uh, we did okay uh, in both scenarios, but I think the, 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 you know, the take home is look at the quality of the bone, the subchondral plate and so forth. Um, and then finally about return to play, uh, do you guys have any concerns after what would be your timeline to get them back to play? And, you know, we've shown in others, uh, the series out of HSS and a couple of others, uh, the military have shown about a 75% return to play. I'm showing you this graph here to show why when they didn't get back to play the 25%, it's interesting. It wasn't always because they had dysfunction and pain. Um, there was this fear of re-injury. There were life or team circumstances. That was the vast majority why they didn't go back to play, but they still had good symptom relief. But we only were able to get them back about 75% of the time. But it just speaks to the fact that the, num that the concept of return to play is a very complex discussion. It's not just who had a problem or who got it fixed, and then they get back or they don't get back because of their problem. They often don't go back or do go back because of other situations that have nothing to do with the problem we treated, just to keep that in mind. So um, just final thoughts on return to play and timeline, Jack, quickly, if you would, and then we'll move on to your presentation. It, it's patient specific. Uh, typically, if they're going back to return to play, I'm going to get an MRI and that's going to help the discussion. It's typically on the order of six to 12 months. Okay. Uh, Andreas? It's quicker with allograft. So I think for a, a more professional athlete, I lean towards allograft just because I feel more comfortable having them run at six months rather than... ACI where we wait a little bit longer. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're pretty much on time and we have a question and answer box. It's open. So um, I think what I'll do is stop sharing and Jack is going to pull up his talk. I think, do you have control right now, Jack? And maybe she switched it over. Yep. Good. You're sharing and we can hear and see you. Is it sharing? Yep. Just go to see you're doing great. Thanks. Great. So I'm gonna discuss a patient with patellofemoral articular cartilage loss. It's a 13 year old patient. Um, she started having instability at eight years of age and has really had both subluxation and dislocation since that time. An outside surgeon performed debridement and then NPFL tightening, but she had recurrence of both instability and pain. She's already been tried with formal therapy, bracing activity modification, but she still has pain and instability. I'll see if this. Jack, if you don't mind, um, put yourself on, uh, on, on slideshow, bottom right. And then to advance, it's in the bottom. Once you go there, uh, go ahead, you know, hit the, hit the big screen. Hey, so you're Brian, present. are you talking yeah. to me? Yeah. You so Jack, go, I can see it, but if you go to presentation mode, that'll bring it up the full, the oh, full I'm thing. Sorry. And then. On the bottom right, there'll be an arrow. When you take your mouse and go over to the bottom right, you'll see an arrow to the right, and that's how you'll advance your slide. Okay. And if you want to play your video, just hover over your video with your yeah, mouse. Yeah, I want to play the video. Can go you for hear it? it? Hang on. No. Do you have headphones in? No. Do you have a microphone on that's external mic? Uh, yeah, I can cut it off. If you take off your external mic, you'll be able to hear the video and just start it over. And use your I microphone. I'll tell you what, why don't you, you've got my tape. Why don't you run it, okay? Yeah, yeah I'm going to share. So, can you just uh, run it? Yep, yeah, no problem. Okay, you got it? Yep. Okay, here we go. So go ahead and play the video now. So your first dislocation is about 2015. Yeah. And what were you doing? Um, I was playing basketball. With basketball. My friends. And you play basketball now? Yes. Does it go out? Yeah. 
How often is your knee cap go out of place? Um, it just happens every now and then. Once a month, once a week? Um, it's just kind of it's random usually. And between episodes when it goes all the way out, does it ever go partially out? Um, sometimes. Uh, how often does that happen? Uh, that happens usually like once a week. Once a week? Mm -hmm. And you had you had surgery by your other doctor. He cleaned it up first, and then he went back and he tightened up the ligament. Did that help at all? Um, it did for a little bit, but it stretched back out. It stretched back out. Mm -hmm. So now you're about like you were before the surgery, or are you different? Uh, I think it's the same. I think yeah. it's really and you do have do you have any pain in it at all? Uh, sometimes. What are you usually doing when you have pain? Um, walking and running. Does it swell? Yeah. Where does it swell? Um, just around the kneecap area. Okay. Are you still doing any exercises? Uh, not right now. Are you wearing a brace at all? Not right now. Okay. Okay. Um, yep. So, Jack, do you want to any comments on that? I'll yeah, so I, I, I think she's kind of downplaying it. Um, so we'll go on to the physical exam. Uh, she's basically has full symmetrical range of motion. And you're seeing that her lateral translation is limited by apprehension and she's subluxed at all times. Do we have sound of that video? Yeah, do you want it? Yeah. Okay, sorry. limited. So her knee is about five degrees of recurvatum, symmetrical. She has 150 on that side, 150 on this side, and we don't really see fluid. Here's displacement. Don't like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm limited. Okay. Sorry, Jack. Is that good enough? Um, forgive me. Yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, her her hip rotation is symmetrical and within normal limits, and you can see her bait and score is within normal limits. So we can go on to imaging. Uh, Brian or Andreas, do you have any comments on these images? You sort of answered it. She looked a little valgus, asymmetric valgus lying there, but I think you're getting to that now. Yeah, it's five degrees. And, you know, on, on these recurrent instability patients, they usually have vulnerable comorbidities. And I kind of go back and forth. Personally, five degree is sort of the gray zone for me. If it's two, three or four degrees, I'm not going to do an osteotomy. If it's, you know, six, seven or eight, then I'm probably going to do an osteotomy. Um, you can see that she is dysplastic on that side, the trochlea, even on a merchant view. And as we all know, that means she's very dysplastic because the dysplasia is best seen towards the entrance and we don't see that on a merchant view. So she's very distally dysplastic, evidence of the prior ossicle from recurrent dislocations, but fortunately has near joint space maintenance. Jack, Thanks. I can't really tell yep. on the lateral, but does she have any kind of bump right up in here? Not a bump, but she does have a positive crossing sign. Mm -hmm. Do you want to clarify what that is so people know? Yeah, so on a true lateral, and that's pretty close to a true lateral, um, the entrance to the trochlea, as we have in a normal patient, their lateral trochlea, the height of it is always higher by definition than the groove. Uh, when the the line that outlines, Brian's pointing to it, the groove that should always be below the trochlea, the lateral trochlea. And so when they cross, that means the floor of the groove is equal to the height of the lateral trochlea and thus it's flat. Or if Brian was asking, is there a bump? It can even be convex. So that's helping to decide, is it a mildly dysplastic, flat or convex, and obviously de jure classifies them as A is dysplastic, but they still have a groove, B is flat, C and D are convex. 
So next we'll show MRI. Hey, Jack, can you, in your physical, were you able to, you could get her immediately by one, you could get her, could you neutralize her or was she effectively quite yeah. tight laterally? Um, she one was plus tight. Medial. So I could get her medial, but it stopped. And then okay. she did have evidence. If further in the exam, it shows that I can somewhat reverse the, so they probably did a lateral release at one of the two prior procedures. And it is possible to get her almost a neutral. So she still has some, what I would say, moderate lateral tightness. But with this sublux positioning, uh, I'm concerned that if we're going to medialize her, we're going to increase that lateral tightness unless you do something. And one final question. Do you give any importance to internal rotation of the tibia during passive flexion when you're examining her to see if that helps? Does that give you any added information in terms of your decision making? Um, well, that just means that the tuberosity is too lateral relative to the trochlear groove. Yeah, so that would place more emphasis on doing something with the tuberosity. Okay. You could see at full extension, she's markedly chronically subluxed. She has yeah. mark wear that goes from the medial facet across the median ridge. And at least in my practice, I see tons of medial facet lesions with recurrent instability. Most of those are asymptomatic. Those, however, that cross the median ridge, they have a much higher incidence of persistent symptomatology. And you can see there's at least a suggestion that there's trochlear cartilage damage as well. And you can argue, is that flat? The articular cartilage looks flat. The bone looks a little concave. And I think trying to pigeonhole trochlear dysplasia into A, B, C, and D, it, it's somewhat um, artificial. And so you have to do it a patient by patient assessment. Jack, so I think the question that, about question about here when the angle that you might put the patient in for so called merchant view or axial view, what would you put the knee in, and and is this a reliable X ray to tell you much? So the merchant view, it, it's the sort of the opposite. If it tells you something, and this is telling me she has trochlear dysplasia and chronic sub subluxation, that means it is severe because this. Many times the merchant view will be normal. It's typically taken at 45 degrees. If you have a very thin patient, you can get more of a Lauren view uh, at 30 degrees. The, the more proximal you can, and the less flexion, the better for looking at the trochlear morphology. But so to emphasize, if you have a normal merchant view, that just tells you nothing. It tells okay. you you need to look further and that go on to a more advanced imaging. What angle does t do you take this at? Forty five. That, that was taken at forty five degrees. Okay, and then finally, CT scan is that? I'm just what I'm trying to do is help some of our questions, which are fitting for this time of the presentation. Yep. CT c CT scan uh, is that part of your? This may have been an older case, but is that part of your algorithm? So that this is a MRI, and I do I do typically do not do CT. Some of the uh, surgeons at International Patel Femoral Study Group really like CT and they like dynamic CT. Uh, the, my dynamic evaluation is done both clinically and arthroscopically. And I don't like to expose these young girls typically to the uh, radi radiation dose of a CT. So I can get most of the information that I want off of an MRI. Okay. So this is, go ahead and uh, keep going. And So here's arthroscopy. You have an uncontained lateral uh, trochlear lesion, and this is the trochlea, not the lateral femoral condyle. And just to explain what I mean by that, that suggests to me her lateral lesion is because of her chronic lateral position of the patella that we, we saw radiographically and clinically. And this is not from that instability episode. The instability episodes typically cause a lesion of the lateral aspect of the lateral femoral condyle margin. So that's the uncontained trochlear lesion. And you can see the patella is, does go across the median ridge. So okay. both of these are grade three, A, three B. And if you can see, there is some bone that, that's poking through on the patella. So it's three C also. And uh, okay. And uh, can you clarify the previous procedure that she had? So I think she just clinically, I didn't have the operative note, but I could, I could um, reverse her close to neutral. So she had evidence of a prior lateral release. And then the operative information was that she had a, probably a, a medial imbrication. 
And for recurrent stability with instability, we all know that's not going to work. Okay. Uh, so what would you do, Brian? Shit. Sorry. Shoot. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I would do that. The mic is hot. Oops. The mic is hot. Um, yeah. So you, you know, what I was listening carefully to when your history is you asked her, uh, does she have instability and does she have pain? And um, what's always fascinating these patients is that pain, maybe they underplay it, but I find in these young patients, pain is actually not terrible. They seem to just tolerate the discomfort they have. If it seems like her primary complaint is instability and um, she has pain. The one thing I didn't hear you ask is, do you have pain separate from your sense of instability? Because I like to know that, but she also swells. So, so I'm assuming she swells independent of instability events. So I think she has two problems. And, if, and the other question I often ask is, what do you place a premium on getting rid of the instability or getting rid of the pain and the swelling? And if they say both, that's fine. It just helps guide you. I also think given her age and the lack of sort of significant morbidity and doing some resurfacing, there's no real downside. Uh, in the 13-year-old with this type of change, my guess is you wouldn't be thinking osteochondriolograph for the cartilage portion. Uh, you'd be thinking you know, surface replacement. So I'm going to guess Macy. And that's where I would go. So I would treat the cartilage. I would treat the cartilage problem because I think her complaints are consistent with the cartilage problem, and she'd probably be happy if you could help her in that regard. And then I would. Um, her alignment was overall good, so I didn't hear a TTTG, but I think conceptually, she's failed something along the MPFL repair side, which, as you say, doesn't work. Um, very high failure rate in this setting. So I would do a, an MPFL reconstruction, uh, two-tailed graft, um, and I would do a. Um, uh, TTO, and I'd use some objective metrics from your pre-ops uh, uh, x-rays to see how far I could get her over immediately. And um, I wouldn't distalize her based upon her the CDI, her, 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 the ratio you had, which was one. I would just move her anterior immediately. And I'd want to get her pretty far anterior as I could tolerate without over medializing her because I think you can almost uncouple those lesions by doing that because they're both lateral, I think, or central lateral on the patella. So uh, anterior medialization, no distalization, MPFL reconstruction, Macy. So at this surgery, I would do a biopsy. So I'll stop there. So yes, both a TTTG and TTPCL were elevated. I think in patellofemoral femoral circles 20 years ago, nobody even, in, at least in the US, really knew what the TTTG was. And we learned from the Europeans and now it's swung to the other side that many of the fellows are, you know, they know exactly what those measurements are. They know the normal limits and they want to treat it based upon those numbers. And now we're kind of swinging the other way. Yes, do we want those numbers in front of us? We certainly do. But then we base our clinical judgment to combine it with those numbers to decide whether or not to do a TTO and then how much do you antrodize and medialize. So, uh, Andreas, do you have anything to add on that? No, I, I, I echo what Brian said. I think the one thing that we can maybe flesh out a little bit more is some people might say, or I've been asked before, look, this patient has a, um, a medial defect on the patella. Why would we want to medialize her with a TTO? Wouldn't that load this defect more? And I think as a concept, yes, at first glance, you might think so, but you said she's she always laterally tracks. So if you look at this MRI scan, that median ridge um, always rubs against the lateral condyle. So if you medialize her, all you do is you actually improve congruency of the patellofemoral joint. So right now she's point on point loading in that area of defect. And if you bring the patella more medial, then that lateral facet can finally participate in, in load sharing and overall the patellofemoral loads will go down. So it, it's just something that my fellows sometimes find confusing. But uh, for these patients, yes, you do have to medialize them. And no, you don't increase load on the medial facet. I think that's, that's, I think that, that's a fantastic good. addition. That's very important yeah. to conceptualize. Yeah, and that's why so I, I think we I can go on unc uncoupling. But you, that was eloquently said because you, you, know, you make the defect essentially less relevant. Whether or not you do something to it biologically may not even matter. But just getting her set in a proper place may be really beneficial to her. So, Jack, do you want to narrate? Um, yeah, so we're doing a medial approach, uh, and we know we're going to do an MPFL reconstruction. So I identified layers one and two and keep layer three intact, go ahead and make my tunnel. I tag layer three, and then I'll divide it. If you go through all three layers, it's going to be a really difficult to reestablish later on. This is a lateral lengthening. 
we're lengthening her approximately two centimeters. There's a superficial oblique layer that I elevated. And here's the deep transverse layer. I'll cut the deep transverse layer. And at the end of the procedure, I'll reapproximate superficial to deep. This is the patellar lesion. I'm debriding it. There is an osteophyte medially. Uh, you can either use a high speed burr cooled with saline or a rongeur in this case. It was very small. Now it's smooth, still an uncontained lesion. So I'm using uh, anchors for these bipolar lesions. Not only will I use anchors in uncontained regions, but also suture them. Here's an anterior medialization. I'm elevating the anterior compartment musculature. You can see I've protected the neurovascular structures. Nice flat plate cut and anchoring with two 4.5 interference or interfrag screws. I've placed my Macy. You can see it's uh, placed three minutes by the clock. I'm not going to trust glue alone, so I am going to augment with 6.0 Vicryl around the other margins. And then we're a final gluing, I'm really repairing the lateral retinaculum prior to doing my MPFL so I can balance the joint. The repair is only done proximally, distally it's left free. This is the socket. I am using a two-arm socket. I'm using an expansion memory device. This allows to avoid rotation. I'm pulling these between layers two and three. There are now suturing layer three. You could have done it before I pulled, it doesn't matter. I use soft tissue slings. So there's a soft tissue sling uh, in the quad like Fulkerson does that I do a soft tissue sling subperiosteal at the patella, avoiding patellar fractures. I suture them back to themselves, then repair and incorporate that into the capsules. I do the capsule repair, then I test I want to make sure it's a nice, smooth, gliding central patella. And I've got one plus medial, one plus lateral patellar displacement with a centrally positioned patella. So that'll be the end of the surgery. Any comments on what I did? Um, well, so a couple things. Um, no trochleoplasty, which we can talk about. Right. I wouldn't do a trochleoplasty either. I think you can accomplish this without a trochleoplasty. Um, uh, Anu, if you could apply, uh, respond to uh, one of the questions about the attendance link, that would be great. The uh, the MPFL that was an allograft, correct? Correct. What did you Studies use? Studies have shown there's no difference between allograft and autograft. Yeah. What did you use? Uh, I'm using Perneus longus. I find these to be a little bit more consistent than semitendinosus, at least the graphs okay. that we get. Yeah. So uh, I, essentially I would do similar. I would uh, make a one incision. I would do a lateral lengthening, but I would approach the entire uh, cartilage problem through the lateral side. I would do my TTO first. So I get more mobility. I don't flip them up. I don't muss around with the fat pad. I just do enough uh, mobilization distally so that I have more mobilization proximally. Evert the patella, manage the cartilage problem. Um, I actually would do the MPFL drilling and everything else first because I don't want to muck around with the patellofemoral joint after I do the ACI last. So I would do the TTO first. I would do a lateral lengthening a surgical exposure laterally. I would not do a medial arthrotomy. I don't know if you did or you didn't. I couldn't tell. Um, I would use a hamstring graft. Again, a lot of ways to get the right. You asked how we would do it. I think that you'll get it right many ways here. I would... Uh, Dock it on the patella. I use very small drill holes that are blind, so it's a tenodesis effect with a three three five hole. And then I would dock it in the femur at the anatometric point. I, you know, maybe I would use fluoro, but I, we've gotten pretty good with just checking it. And I always check the the length of the graft to make sure that you know they're not getting tighter in flexion because that's the one thing they already have every reason to get stiff after this operation. So I make sure the MPFL isn't contributing to that. So it's a balanced MPFL. I set that length, but I don't set it until I fix the tibia. So I do the osteotomy tibia, do all the preparation on for the MPFL, do all the prep for the cartilage, fix the tibial tubercle osteotomy where I want it. Then I fix my MPFL where I want it. And then I finish with cartilage and I don't do a medial arthrotomy. I do all the work through the lateral because I don't want to muck around with the uh, VMO. That's just my approach on that. Yeah, so I, I've done this a variety of ways over the past 20 years. And in this case, I, I first, I'll look in with my lateral lengthening 
And if I can avert and get adequate exposure with a lateral lengthening approach, that's the way to go. I typically will now leave the tuberosity attached while I'm doing the debridement. It's just because my assistant has a more difficult time controlling the patella when, it's, when the tuberosity is osteotomized. And so this just gives a little bit more control. That's the only reason on the, yeah. the order. Andreas, how about yourself? It's really just a variation on the theme. I, I do the same thing. I um, I do also do the osteotomy first, and then I leave the tubercle actually, as you had said, attached distally, but the proximal part, a sort of position that makes it easier to get the patella averted. Um, and then I usually prepare cartilage and then I sort of assess how I can get the exposure. I'd, I'd like ideally to fix my tuberosity um, and do my MPFL so that I can do the, the isometry without worrying about the, the ACI graft. Um, but sometimes once you have your MPFL in, it's hard to evert the patella. So um, sometimes I do the MPFL last. And I agree, I, I try and approach it through the, the lateral side. So Jack, for the we'll peripheral pitfalls, the next couple I'd just of like to emphasize that for treatment of the comorbidity, and in this case, what are we going to do with valgus malalignment of five degrees, and what are we going to do with trochlear dysplasia? Um, I would like to try to do the least amount of surgery and get the best outcome. So that's why I elected not to do those two. Also, with trochleoplasty, you're, you're supposed to have an intact trochlea. She doesn't have an intact trochlea. She's a small person, so if I start doing a formal trochleoplasty, I'm going to be doing something to the region of that I'm trying to do the cartilage restoration. So Schubenstein and, and et al. showed that their, their results with type B trochlear dysplasia without treating with trochleoplasty was just as effective as those studies that did treat it. So that was... That was my thought process on not doing a trochleoplasty. I like Macy in this area, it conforms to the topology of the patellofemoral compartment and rehab is extremely important. Um, if, I, if some of these patients are from out of state, those patients, I would rather have them see my therapist and then do a home program guided by my therapist than not see a therapist who I don't know that really has never seen one of these before because they can uh, take a, you know, a potentially good result and make it a poor result. So physical therapy is extremely important. Jack, one question was, which I think is a good one, is what are the risks of over medialization of the uh, tubercle and uh, what, what is the potential complication of doing so? What was that? If you over medialize it, was that the question? Yeah, if you over medialize the tibial tubercle. Yeah, so uh, Ryosuke Kuroda uh, has a paper many years ago that was in a laboratory paper that showed over-medialization not only increases the medial patellofemoral stress, so obviously that's gonna cause wear, but it could also cause increased loading to the medial tibial femoral compartment. So over-medialization uh, is certainly to be avoided. So we're trying to normalize them. If they have a TTTG on the order of 24, I wanna get them down in the range of the teens. So. 13, 14, 15, they don't have to go to 10 or, you know, what is normal 10 to 13 uh, if you look at multiple studies. So I, I would rather err on slightly leaving them higher than, than over medializing. Okay, thank you. And I left the rehab slide up so people can review it, if that's okay. Maybe people could take a picture of it on their computer. If you don't mind, I think I would move on and let you finish up with the literature. Yeah, the literature just shows that uh, when done properly, comorbidities are treated, you can have a 80 to 93% good or excellent result across multiple studies with multiple authors. So if you'll add the audio so you can hear her. Plus lateral, one plus medial over there. It's going one plus, one plus. I know if you should tighten your muscle up here, tighten it here. See you do a straight leg raise. Excellent. I'll see you do it over here. Great. Let's see you bend this one all the way up. Bend this one all the way up. Okay. Take it back out. Okay, do this one. 
And really, no, I'm not causing any pain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you had your surgery about five months ago, um, and you were on crutches for six weeks. Is that correct? How was your pain after surgery? Um, pretty bad. Um, the first a lot. Like the first two weeks. First two weeks was pretty intense, and then it started evening off when? Um, after that, I started evening off, and then once I could walk, it like didn't really hurt all day. When did you start walking? Uh, eight weeks. At eight weeks. And from eight weeks until now, how would you rate your pain, zero to 10? Um, just like a, maybe a one sometimes. Okay, sitting here, it's a what? It's like a zero. It gets, then like sitting for a long time. It okay, gets kind of <laughs> it gets a little stiff. Yeah. What's the most active thing you're doing? Walking. Just walking on level ground, because we've got you off stairs and inclines for six months, right? Um, are you taking any medicines for it at all? Um, occasionally, time on but not that much. Just occasionally. Are you still going to therapy? Are you just doing everything on your own? Everything on my own for right now. How long have you been doing it on your own? Uh, a little over a month. Okay, great. Brian and Andreas, do you have any comments on that? I mean, it, she has a long road ahead of her, but I think these are really challenging problems, especially in young kids like that. Maybe one question, if we have, if we have a minute or so. It, so you did a tibial tubercle osteotomy, and I think that that's really crucial. But sometimes I see ten-year-olds who have that issue. I mean, she started when she was eight. At which, at that age, we can't really do TTOs. Um, have you? done just MPFL reconstructions in that population, almost like a temporizing measure, um, but having a discussion with them that most likely will have to come back and do a TTO when they're fully grown? Yes, yeah. So, you, you, you know, they can start as, well, you saw this girl started at age eight. So I've seen some that are eight, nine, and 10 years old. Um, and yeah, we go through that whole discussion. In fact, I'll do a Physeal sparing, MPFL, and lateral lengthening, and then tell them that once they're fused, um, if they're having symptoms, then we'll come back. And surprisingly, a subset will will still be asymptomatic even when their growth is completed. Um, timeline to return to sport, the minimum, assuming they feel well, uh, Jack. Yeah, I, I just don't trust. You know, it's a bipolar lesion. It's patella. I'm telling them 12 months is when we can just start discussing it. And then at that time frame, they have to have, you know, 90, 95% strength, and then they have to pass a functional progression program. So I use time, 12 months, and then at 12 months, if they don't have full strength and they can't go through a functional progression program, or if they fail their functional progression, it, we just wait until they can pass it. This was a anterior medialization, so you did an oblique cut about 60 degrees. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. And then quickly, and then let's move on to Andreas's case. And Andreas, do you, can, do you want to take over when you do your case? Yeah, I can share my screen. Okay. Um, quickly, uh, share your fixation currently uh, for the MPFL, both on the patella and the femur. I use a bio, uh, tenodesis screw on the femur. Um, and I use two uh, peak uh, three five biotinodesis type uh, anchors against the tendon in a in a fifteen millimeter tunnel uh, on the patella, and yet to have a fracture with that. And I, but I'll probably have one next week. But I just said that. So uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, do you guys want to share, Andreas? What do you do? So I use a, a tenodesis screw on the femur, um, just like you. I, I used to use a biotinodesis screw, but if and maybe that's just subjective. But I've had some patients who had increasing pain sort of three to six months out and I felt that was maybe when that screw is starting to disintegrate so I've switched to peak screws on the femur just need to be careful that you really seed it all the way because obviously they're not going to go away okay. and then on the patella I use knotless anchors just a small 1.8 millimeter um, and not knotless sorry um, all suture anchor so uh, the, thank you 
on the femur, as you saw, I'm, I'm really trying to recreate the two arms. So the two extremes of the MPFL, native MPFL. And I don't want those to twist as I'm putting in a screw. So I'm using a memory shaped device. So I put the device in and then I expand it and that will trap it. It's made out of peak uh, for the patella and for the quad. I make a subperiosteal dissection into the patella and I do the quad just like John Fulkerson. So these are two soft tissue slings. And I've been doing this technique for about five years and, and really haven't seen it, any change in recurrent instability from using an anchor fixation that I did before. Okay, Andreas, do you want to take over and share? And, yeah. and Jack, I don't know if you can see the question and answer while Andreas is presenting. Okay, a, I will. Carrillo, he, has a, he has a complicated question that I don't think I can answer. So I'm going to leave that one to you. <laughs> All right. So um, I want to present a, a little bit of a complicated case that I did a long time ago, actually. And I intentionally wanted to pick something that I did a long time ago because it adds the dimension of what would even I do differently now, because we all have learning curves um, yeah. when we do these procedures and we start out maybe staging more. And then as we get more comfortable and quite frankly, better with doing these procedures and faster in the OR. Bottom left, it's, there's an arrow. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So are you trying to find the forward or am I just, I'm not sure if the computer froze. Andreas maybe froze. Yes, somehow. Huh? Okay, so I'm gonna go to, um, he's probably gonna sign back in again. That's my guess. Yes. There he goes. So Brian, while you're setting that up, there are a couple questions. One is talking about patellar alta with early OA changes. What other treatment besides strengthening, bracing? Um, we all know that patellar alta really markedly is uh, causes abnormal patellofemoral biomechanics. So that that would be leading to that early OA. Um, the, the discussion on whether to distalize, anteromedialize with distalization, patellofemoral arthroplasty. All those are going to be dependent upon the specifics of the individual patient. I'm uh, I'm actually back. It's, all right, uh, fine. Do you want to? Do you think Andreas, you have it's a bandwidth issue at all with where you're at? If you're sharing, no, now? it's okay. uh, go ahead it's, and share. My wife came and the laptop decided to switch on to the hotspot in the car. So got it. All <laughs> it's right. perfect timing. So right. at what point did uh, did you were just uh, go, go ahead to the next uh so you're not seeing my screen right you're seeing yours go ahead and share yours again yeah we share right perfect timing um <laughs> yeah so she had an acl from um, contact soccer injury um this was treated with an allograft reconstruction you know this was 2011 a little unusual now somewhat unusual then but she also had partial medial and lateral meniscectomies. And then the one thing that was unusual was she had a post-op intraarticular pain pump placed for, uh, for three days post-op. And at the time, at least, we had a lot of data from the shoulder that that's a bad idea, but um, nonetheless, she had it for her knee. Uh, initially, she had an uneventful recovery, then she had increasing pain starting at about six months post-op. And uh, that's when she had additional imaging being done. But Let's start with the physical exam. So when she saw me, and again, this is about a year after her ACL reconstruction, incisions were fine. She had a little bit asymmetric valgus on the affected side, uh, some quad atrophy, range of motion. Uh, she lacked full extension. She has small effusion. Uh, overall, she's a little stiff, so decreased patel mobility. And she has a, had a grossly unstable knee with a 3B Lachman and a, a grade one pivot shift, stable collaterals. If we go into imaging, um, maybe focus on the alignment x-rays on the right. So she had asymmetric valgus increased on the affected right side. And she had a little bit of lateral joint space narrowing. Uh, the MRI scan that she had before she saw me showed uh, somewhat extensive arthrofibrosis. You can see uh, her, her huffas is pretty scarred down. 
she had small um, medial and lateral meniscal remnants and she had a lot of subchondral bone reaction in especially her lateral compartment. Her femoral tunnels were a little bit widened. Um, so that's what we had seen at the time. And I took her for an arthroscopy uh, which really showed bilateral lateral compartment cartilage defects. The middle image that shows her tibial plateau, you notice there's really no meniscus at all. This almost looks like someone had prepared it already for, uh, for some cartilage treatment. And then on the, uh, the image here, that's her lateral femoral condyle with exposed bone. Uh, but interestingly enough, in her trochlea, it was really sloughing off. So the probe here is underneath a flap of, of trochlea cartilage that's still attached approximately in this flame. So it was just, and it was very soft. So it was a very unusual presentation. I mean, the only reason I could find for why she should have this was the, uh, the post-op pain pump, at least in the trochlea, the lateral compartment you can explain just having had a, a lateral meniscectomy and especially in young women that can happen pretty quickly, uh, especially if they're in a little bit of valgus. So, you know, just to summarize, so this is a 15 year old who presents with both instability and pain. She had an ACL, which is non-functional. She has bipolar lateral compartment defects with asymmetric valgus. And then she has a cartilage defect in her, her trochlea at all uh, as well. So um, Jack, what, uh, what are your thoughts? At this age, we have to treat everything. So we want to all hands on deck. I think the alignment needs to be addressed. Um, depending upon tunnels, you, at the staging arthroscopy you did, those tunnels could be bone grafted in preparation, removing any hardware. And then um, typically, I'd have to see more about what's going on with that tibial plateau. So the lateral femoral condyle, because of all the other activities, I would like an earlier aggressive rehabilitation. So I'd probably go towards osteochondral allograft with a lateral meniscus transplant. If the transplant covers the tibia plateau, then I'd probably just do uh, either nothing or a light marrow stimulation. Um, and obviously the revision ACL. Right. On the, the revision ACL, pardon? The tibial defect was more central. So if you put a, a meniscus in, Sort of what you see of the tibial plateau is essentially what was missing. Yeah, then I'd probably do marrow stimulation. I, 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 I'm certainly not going to do an osteochondral allograft at this time. If, if you look at bipolar tibial femoral osteochondral allografts, um, the, the results are certainly muted. Um, yeah. But that could be, uh, you could do both of those with uh, an ACI type of approach. Um, I think if I'm going to do bipolar tibial femoral, I might lean towards uh, ACI over osteochondral allograft, but it's an individual case by case consideration. Brian, how about you? You're muted still. Brian, you're muted. Brian, you, you're muted still. In 2020, that was the number one uh, statement. Unmute your microphone. <laughs> that was <laughs> the most common statement. Unmute your microphone. Um, shocker. Okay, so uh, several issues, as Jack uh, pointed out. You've got, uh, and, and, and I think the age warrants correcting as much, if not all, and knowing, you know, guarded, but you've got some low-hanging fruit because of alignment. So, um, and you want to do your best operation possible for each of these. So there are times when you've got, uh, so a lot of this is timing, but we all, as far as how you decide to do it, and there'll be, you know, dealer's choice, but I would correct alignment, but I would not overcorrect. I wouldn't overcorrect anyway, because it's of it's valgus. So I'd bring her to neutral, but I think you said she was medial metastectomized and you certainly don't want to overload the inside. So I would bring her to neutral and I would do a distal femoral osteotomy, although I could argue maybe proximal tibial valgus or varus producing too, because you might be able to do something biplanar. The problem is a lot of work on the tibia is going to be done with the meniscus and the ACL. So I think doing the femur is kind of nice to stay away from everything. So uh, I don't have a problem doing combined operations. I get that asked that a lot. If you're doing a distal femur osteotomy, 
Uh, I don't have a problem with also doing an ACL with also doing an OA graft of the femur. So I would, uh, in, we can talk about timing, but she needs a great ACL. Her tunnels didn't look terrible. If I needed to figure it out further, I'd probably get a CAT scan, but I would do, and, sorry, Andres, what's her age again? 15. Yeah. So I want the best graft humanly possible. So I probably would go for air towards BTB autograft. I don't think her tunnels look terrible. So, um, but if they are, then you had some more studies to prove it or, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, a question if you decided to stage it. So uh, sta uh, uh, staging arthroscopy like you did to see what's going on, then I would contemplate um, DFO, uh, lateral meniscal transplant, osteochondral allograft femur, do something to the tibia, whether it's covered or not, I'll, I would probably do something. Maybe it's a light excoriation or maybe it's a marrow stimulation or you could use anything you know, particulate. I mean, the, the interesting thing that we've shown is that the tibial disease is pretty well tolerated no matter what you do. Um, it's the femur and the malalignment. If you said, well, look, I'm just going to do a, a realignment procedure and an ACL to give her stability and we'll see how she does. Frankly, I would, so I would support that too. Um, and you have a faster recovery with that. You can see how she does give her six months. Uh, but then you're combining rehab protected weight bearing. If you have to go back and do something cartilage wise. So have no problem doing everything. Lateral missile transplant, lateral from a conway graft in my case, Trochlea, your call, it sounded like most of her pain was laterally. You can either ignore it or do something. And I wouldn't do an allograph for the trochlea, though, because I didn't sense that she had a lot of anterior pain. A small correction to get her to neutral uh, primary ACL with a BTP autograft. That would be, I think, where I would go with this. So let, let's go through what I did, and I can tell you what I would do nowadays. So, um, so at the time of the arthroscopy, um, I mean, this was five years in practice, so now I'm 15, 16 years. So at that point, I figured it would be a little bit much to do all of that together. So I, I did a DFL um, and your point of not overcorrecting is, is very well taken, especially with someone who had something going on in their medial compartment. Um, I removed her, her screws from the ACL reconstruction. I did some um, bone grafting for her tunnels. Uh, at the time, I didn't do a Macy biopsy because I felt that based on the, the intrathecular pain pump, the cartilage is really compromised. I think nowadays um, I might um, go to the other knee, actually harvest cartilage from the other knee. We had done a study recently that looked at, so the quality of Macy biopsies, and if you have a multiply operated knee, the, the biopsy quality uh, goes down. So in that sense, my threshold of going to the other knee would be fairly low. Um, because of that, at the time, I made a decision to go the allograft route and uh, came back, did, as mentioned, a lateral meniscus allograft transplantation. I used an osteochondral allograft for the lateral femur and then used particulate cartridge allograft for both the lateral tibial plateau at the trochlea. Did a revision ACL reconstruction. I used donor graft back then, but now, Ryan, I agree, I would use autograft. I'm more of a hamstring person, but you can do hamstring, you can do quad, you can do BTB. It's really what you're comfortable with. I think the outcomes are, are fairly similar, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, she's not going, this is not a design to get her back to cutting, pivoting sports. Oh, you just wanted yeah. to give her a stable knee. So yeah. you could do any, frankly, you could do any ACL graft if you wanted. She right. probably, you'd achieve your goal. Right. And I think your point of uh, sort of just doing stability and an unloading osteotomy is, is a good one. And I think if this were a patient who's, let's say in their 30s, um, I would do that. I think I would just do a, a realignment osteotomy. Don't do any cartilage in the lateral compartment. Give them stability and just have a discussion that hopefully we gain you 10 years and we do a lateral uni and, and overall that might be an easier recovery. But in a 15 year old, as, a, as we've all said, that's not really an option. In terms of her, her tibial, I'm sorry, her trochlear disease, um, that's really this very bizarre presentation that I've never seen Otherwise, I mean, usually you get cartilage where you get focal defects, you get delamination, but that this just turns into essentially a soft tissue goober. I haven't really seen outside these um, pain pump patients. And then the other thing that I don't do anymore is I don't flip the tubercle up like that anymore because you really, we did another study looking at tubercle, tubercle flipping um, because you have to really brutalize the fat pad doing that, the, the rates of arthrofibrosis are, are much, much higher. So I don't do that anymore. It does make the axis pretty easy though. So um, this is what her, her joints look like. Um, Brian had mentioned before, why did I sort of separate out the meniscus transplant? Her um, tibial ACL tunnel, um, it, 
sometimes go straight through the, the graph. So at the time when I did an ACL at the same time as a lateral meniscus transplant, I would just separate that out. Now I just simply use a, a bone plug technique into your anterior and posterior to the ACL um, tibial tunnel. So that's not really a concern uh, at all anymore. And then this was a, an OCA graph. And again, that exposure makes me cringe a little bit as well. I don't do that anymore, but at the time, you know, being able to gain access is uh, more helpful. So you see the, the TTO down here, you see the, um, the slot for the lateral meniscus transplant and then the ACL tunnel. Once everything is put back together, um, it looks a little bit more uh, amenable. Now, one year post-op, she, uh, she had some increased pain. We got imaging and she had failed to a lateral femoral condyle allograft and it, it was an odd failure. It was really the cartilage that failed. Well, the most common um, failure of osteocondyle allograft is really more through the bone. So she ended up with a revision of her lateral femoral condyle OCA, but I had a chance at the same time to look at her trochlean. What I had done actually was I had left this, the soft tissue surface intact and essentially just prepared the bone underneath and, and stuck the, the de novo underneath and that healed. I mean, that's a very unusual case, but her trochlea and her knee pain went completely away. And um, three years post-op, she had some hardware related pain um, and we took out the DFO plate, but so you can see her incisions, her motion, it's not perfect, but for a big um, hit like that, it's actually fairly decent. And this is the imaging. So a little fuzz in her trochlea, but overall not bad. Her lateral um, corneal OCA had healed in and her meniscus you know, has a little bit of a frame, but wasn't bad. And her tibial plateau actually had healed in uh, and really well. So in terms of the results, busy slides, we're not gonna go over that, but Al Getgood and, and Bill Bugby had looked at just combinations of cartilage repair and meniscus transplant and overall I think all these three studies that looked at combination patient, uh, papers, the middle one with, with Brian, probably the most appropriate because those were all osteotomies, meniscus transplants and cartilage repair. They all share a very high reoperation rate. So you really need to tell your patients, look, you, you have a 50% chance of having another surgery afterwards. <coughs> Doesn't mean 50% chance of failure. Actually, in fact, most of these patients did okay, which is shocking, but I would, still say you have an about 25 to 30 percent failure rate and we're trying to get you 10 to 15 years you will have definitely smaller cleanup surgery um, and then a larger surgery coming your way at some point and that might be a, a revision of osteocondyl allograft um, or a macy um, at some point probably a uh, arthroplasty as well the one point where i would say what would i do differently now I think for her, uh, Brian, you had mentioned maybe a, a closing wedge HTO to address the, the valgus. I think for a case like that, that would be elegant um, because I decided to do a TTO at the same time and you can do a TTO and that closing wedge through the same incision. Um, so you stay away from the femur and avoid that incision. That's worked pretty well in my hands. So I think these days I probably would do scope a Macy biopsy from the other name, do a medial wedge closing HTL, um, and then come back, do my lateral meniscus transplant and revision ACL reconstruction at the, uh, at the same time, and use Macy for the trochlear tibial plateau and lateral condyle. And the reason you would do a medial tibial plateau closing is, is, to, uh, is why? Um, because I need to get, I, I do these now mostly through separate incisions. So I do one incision for the joint, one for the, the TTO. Um, so I reuse the same incision that I used for the, uh, the HTO. I use that again for the TTO. Um, and then also if you look at the, a DFO really unloads the joint mainly in near full extension because you do a coronal plane in the femur while a proximal tibial osteotomy work both in extension and flexion. Um, if someone has, let's say, just a femoral defect that's closer to full extension, it doesn't matter. But if you have someone who has a tibial defect, 
you want to unload them really throughout the range of motion that works better from a tibial perspective than a femoral. And what's the purpose of TTO for exposure? No, I, I mean, she had a, a pretty large trochlear defect and her, her patella, even though the patella didn't require any work, but it wasn't pristine. So at the time okay, I felt- So that was to unload it and to, yeah. to, that was why you did it, right? Correct. Got it. Okay. Um, you made a comment about failure of OA graph, which I'm not sure has been my experience. You mentioned that the most common failure is bone. I think on MRI, that's the most common finding. But from when I look at our revisions for OA graph, which happens about 30% of the time, we have to go back. I wouldn't call it revision, but to your point, going back. So we have about a 30% reoperation rate for simple cartilage problems and, and 50% reported like everyone else did for these. And good point that they often get better after you do that, or they're not a disaster. Their their odds ratio to go on to replacements like six to seven, uh, compared to those who don't need reoperations, whatever that's worth. But um, we we uh, when I see a failed away graph, the most common failure is either what you showed, and thankfully that's the case. The second most because you feel like you can do something. Uh, the second most common failure is where they do have some bony change, but their cartilage is perfect. And I don't really know what to do with those. Right. So, so I guess if you say failure, what you can treat is what you showed failure for reasons they still hurt. I have no idea is what you said, <laughs> but I don't know what the heck to do with those. That's the biggest challenge we have. Cause I get, e you know, texts and emails about from people who are saying all the time, well, I did the graph, they still have pain. And I did it. I did an MRI and they have cystic change or whatever, but the graft is still stable. And I don't know what to do with those because I don't think I'm going to do better if I just redo their OA graph to make their MRI better. I just don't right. know why they're hurting. And I think that's the biggest challenge. But so that's a that was a great case. I'm just trying to think if there's anything. Oh, yeah. So I, one question I had is, did your decision to bone graft the tunnels, did you feel that you had to do it or you figured, well, I'm there anyway. Why not just do that, set the stage for the ACL, and I'll do the DFO at that time? Is that what your rationale was? It, it didn't come out quite well on the, the MRI scans. But uh, her tibial tunnel was very posterior. So I felt that the tunnels were just not ideal. Okay. And would you, if you were an older patient, would you have thought about just realignment um, to neutral and um, ACL primary revision? Would that have been your dealer's choice and just ignore everything else potentially? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Jack, any comments? Well, when you're talking about an older patient, I think we need to be specific on how old you're talking about, um, because you know you have very active 50 year olds or 55 year olds, and in that group, I'm probably going to do exactly what you said was to avoid doing cartilage restoration, and then if they fail, that fail, then we'd also bring up the discussion of a partial knee replacement. Yeah, I think that's the point. It's not that we're treating old people, we're discriminating treatment for older people. They're just, you know, chronologically further along. The challenge is with this patient with cartilage is we just know it's a guarded prognosis, but we seem to be willing to take the chance. It's guarded not because you're going to make them worse. It's just you may not make them better. So we, so we feel that, and this is my thought about this, is we use age a lot. Like I, I, the first question I ask when people talk about cases, how old is a patient? Because I'm immediately thinking down a different algorithm, but it's not linear. It's, it's just, it just sways you one way or another, how you're going to stage things or just not do, do anything at all for certain problems. So when it comes to the cartilage issue, we tend to use age as a big indicator to say, look, this person, God willing, has lots and lots of years to live. Might as well just give them everything and see what survives versus the older patient. We say, I could possibly still get the same result, but I'll ignore the cartilage problem. And hopefully the same bridge I build will be meaningful for that patient. But you're right, Jack. I mean, age is a tough one and, and it's not linear and it's not what's too old or too young. The only other thing I'd say about age is that you're often dealing with a different problem in a quote older person than you're dealing with a younger person. Although this one is a maybe a chemical co contributing factor, like Andreas is pointing out, with that delamination and so forth, that bubbly. It's like the cartilage just gets is melting away. Mm -hmm. So it's just an interesting observation because we do use age a lot, but it's just a relative consideration about what we put, what trigger we pull, which one we, which lever we pull, which lever we don't pull. Yeah, and, and the, al al along with age is you know where they are in their life and what their support system is. Uh, yeah, you know most of these kids in college and high school. Their mom's hovering around like a helicopter. Uh, you have somebody that's 40 or 50, they're probably the breadwinner and they, they don't have time for 12 months of rehabilitation. Yeah. And I think it's also what Brian had alluded to. It's if you look at patients like that, their problem never goes away. So we can sort of palliate a little bit over time, but 
And when I talk to these patients, my goal is to get them somewhere into their maybe late 50s or early 60s would be ideal. Um, and then they can, quote unquote, have a knee replacement. But when you look at this backwards, how do you get them there? So if you say, let's say 60 for a total knee replacement, the first revision is easy. So if you can do a uni at age 45, buy them 15 years, gets them to 60, you do one revision and then they're sort of okay. But now how do you get a 15 year old to age 45? Um, doing a partial on her, she might, she would have a much easier recovery and she might be pretty pain free, but that uni is not gonna last her till 45. And generally we don't revise unis to unis. So that's why we want something before to get her to the mid forties and then you can do your uni. And I do unis and I think they're great operations, but you know they are option limiting after a uni you generally do a total and you don't want that to happen when you're too young. I think we've been talking about this concept of bridging surgery uh, for many, many years. And now I think we're all seeing <laughs> the results. We're seeing the, uh, the other end. I mean, yesterday I just saw a lady who's now in her mid forties and I operated on her when she was a teenager. And so she's now failing. She's not failed, but she is failing. Probably will need an arthroplasty at age 50. So both to the patient and to myself, that's a success. Right. Um, if you talk to an arthroplasty surgeon, I'll go, oh, you were just kind of mucking around. No, I wasn't. I was trying to bridge her till she's more age appropriate for arthroplasty. Well, I think we're going to have to wind down. I, I want to thank Anouk and uh, Ste uh, Stefan Zeiler for uh, contributing. I know we're, on, we're just in all kinds of time zones, which is one of the challenging aspects of uh, doing a webinar and for people taking their Saturdays to do this. Um, and, and most importantly to, uh, Jack and Andreas, um, it's always great to see you guys. And I, I personally miss this kind of banter and this is for me, a fine way to have a Saturday morning starting out. So, um, yeah. I hope that the participants enjoyed it and, uh, there will be a follow-up email to evaluate the program and provide some suggestions. I know we can always do better, What I, what you see on the screen here is the next one is Thursday, May 20th. And um, that's, uh, you can see the times, uh, time zones there. And I feel you should sign up to the ICRS website, uh, but this will be on evidence and innovation for scaffold augmented uh, single stage cartilage repair. And I'm sure just given the speakers uh, and the experts that this will be a, 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 an awesome presentation uh, of uh, case-based learning. So with that, I wish all of you a, a good morning, good afternoon and good evening. And, um, it, it, and I wanna thank you all for your participation. And uh, th again, thank you to Jack and Andreas. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Brian, for putting this together.